Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Panita Kala, and I'm the program director at the Institute for South Asia Studies. Thank you for joining us at our third annual undergraduate research symposium, a symposium designed to showcase South Asia-related original research by UC Berkeley undergraduate students. This year, we are extremely pleased to present the extraordinary work of four students with topics ranging from the influence of Hindutva on Indian American youth, the cultural context of queer politics in India, the trauma and violence on Sri Lankan Tamil refugees in the US, and a granddaughter's attempt through the lens of poetry and creative writing at understanding her grandmother's life. This symposium honors the time and effort that these students have put into their research projects over the past year. Please join me in celebrating and honoring them with a big round of applause. So our first presenter today is Rebecca Dharmapalan. Rebecca is an artist and activist from Oakland, California. As a 21-year-old sociology student at UC Berkeley, her passion lies in the human rights and justice for underrepresented and marginalized groups. From her TED talk discussing the epidemic of child sex trafficking in the United States to speaking up in the classroom when voices are silenced, Rebecca's dedication to uplifting those around her speaks truth to her dedication and to, uh, 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 to her dedication to her community. Rebecca will be presenting a thesis titled "Unrecognized Genocide: The Case of Sri Lanka: <coughs> Intergenerational Trauma, Abuse, and Selective Memory." Her discussion today is a thesis advisor, Professor Darren Zhu. Uh, please join me in welcoming Rebecca to the podium. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here and to uh, present this research. Hey, Zook. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so this is my thesis, uh, Unrecognized Genocide, the Case of Sri Lanka. Um, I'll begin now. <coughs> Vachan, do you see yourself as Elam Tamil or Sri Lankan Tamil? I asked. Vachan responded, Elam Tamil? I don't know, what is the meaning of Elam Tamil? I was confused. If he grew up in Jaffna during the peak of civil war, how is he unaware of the liberation Tamil Tigers Elam? Noticing that I was perplexed, he continued, in Sri Lanka, if I said those words, Elam Tamil, you would never see me again. So I don't know those words. I don't know them. This was the most astringent moment for me. At this point, I realized that my fears are Vachan's reality. I quite literally had to grasp the subject matter of my research. The extent to which his experiences affected his identity symbolized the gravity of geographical and cultural displacement, as well as the trauma and selective memory of displaced Tamil Sri Lankans. This leads me to my research questions. How does the definition of genocide function to scale war crimes, violence, and trauma, and reproduce inequalities of classification? More specifically, in what, date, uh, in what ways does its definition confirm historically identified genocides while overlooking and condemning other episodes of mass violence? My second question is, how does selective memory prevail within a post-war, post-genocide diaspora? And my last question is, how is trauma from Sri Lanka intergenerational? My ethnographic research started in fall 2017 when I first visited California International High School. It was my hope, it, uh, I had hopes of meeting one student from Sri Lanka to inquire about the state of post-war asylum seekers. I was pleasantly surprised to meet not one, but three students who have migrated from Sri Lanka to California within the past five years. I first met with Jaya, a 16-year-old girl who was born in Sri Lanka, later moved to Thailand after the war had ended. After living in Thailand for four years, her mother and siblings relocated to California. Later on, I met Panita and Vachan, who are sister and brother. They, moved, uh, they migrated from Sri Lanka to California one year ago and live with their family of six in a small two-bedroom duplex. Jaya, Panita, and Vachan illuminate trauma that manifests within survivors of war and unrecognized genocide. Genocide the threshold. So genocide is usually viewed as a numbers <coughs> The more deaths, the more recognition. When researchers focus on qu uh, quantity, we often overlook critical issues that are experienced on a very visceral micro level. Because of the nuanced nature of genocide, it is critical that we prioritize individual stories over the quantity of death counts. 
This thesis explores the theory of genocide and interacts with scholars who are currently debating its relationship to war crimes that took place in Sri Lanka. This theory works to provide context for larger conversations within the diaspora regarding justice for Tamils and po possible reparations. The inclusion of genocide theory also speaks to the origins of its terminology and the tendencies of international bodies to prioritize certain episodes of mass violence over others. Coined by Raphael Lemkin in 1945, the term genocide has come to carry a weight that surpasses most, if not all, crimes against humanity. Genocide, the crime of all crimes. So rather than convincing, our, uh, uh, rather than convincing readers that what happened in Sri Lanka is genocide, I, inse I instead seek to present unbiased evidence, the psychological effects of denial, and ultimately make a case for reparations. It is my understanding that while uh, political science and human rights have had uh, a tendency of interpreting the law as a stable fact, I use sociology, which is a discipline uh, that observes the law as malleable with the ability to transform itself based on power, intersectional realities, and the social factors of place and time. The latter is how I have approached this paper, understanding that while genocide is technically defined, those that define it possess their own biases and motivations that incite preferences to particular groups. This goes back to the age-old question of who lives are valued and whose deaths are remembered. Um, because the Sri Lankan Civil War can be contextualized as an, as an ethnic conflict, understanding ethnicity in Sri Lanka is extremely critical. The historical framework and formation of today's Sri Lanka uh, plays a salient role in the understanding of civil war. Sri Lanka is racially, linguistically, and religiously diverse. Uh, the Sinhalese majority, who are Buddhist and uh, some are Christian, of Sri Lanka's population inhabit the south, central, and western parts of the country. The minority ethnic group are Tamils, who are Hindus and Christians, and they inhabit the northern and eastern portions of the island. Uh, the ancient empires of the island uh, came to an end during the reign of three colonial empires, the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the British. The British were able to establish a central government in the capital city of Colombo by 1833. During this period, the first formations of divide and conquer were established. The divide and rule, which was imposed by the British around the world, uh, managed to implement a divide and rule policy in a heterogeneous but united peaceful country. In addition to the British suggesting that Sri Lanka be split into two countries, separated by ethnicity, it is said that the British gave pre preferential treatment to Tamils as well. Yet this argument has often been used to justify anti-Tamil racism. When Sri Lanka gained independence in 1948, the newly established state of Sri Lanka was found and its formations encouraged the Sinhalese population to take advantage of their majority status and strengthen numbers. The formation of a, po uh, of a post-colonial Sri Lankan state was rooted in creating a national identity that did not include the ontological existence of Tamils. As the Sri Lankan government attempted to reclaim their roots and cultural heritage through Buddhist nationalism, they excluded and discriminated against Tamils. The Sri Lankan state exploited ontological genocide as a means of establishing uniformity. These practices formed the foundation of, a, of racist sentiments within Sinhalese nationalist discourse. As a result, the Sinhalese only act was approved, which made Sinhalese the official language of the country. This bill was, once, uh, was the first discriminatory actions taken by the Sinhalese Sri Lankan government, along with programs that subjugated and displaced Tamil people. Uh, this thorough historical context provides a critical framework through which we can understand the formation of the Liberation Tamil Tigers Elam, or the LTTE, as an insurgent reaction to ontological genocide and socio-cultural subjugation. This history of brutal, discriminatory state violence ultimately sets a tone for genocide of Tamil populations in Sri Lanka. Uh, the creation of the LTTE posed an immediate threat to the Sinhalese government. In 2008, the Sri Lankan government designed a massive offensive to finally defeat the LTTE. The government began plotting an attack on Kilinachi, the capital town first claimed and established by the LTTE in 1990 for Tamil civ civilians. The Sri Lankan government wanted to instill fear um, within its international communities present in Sri Lanka so that they would have reason to leave the island. The Sri Lankan government told the United Nations that they could no longer guarantee their safety. They must leave Kilinachi and the tiger-held areas. The UN official spokesperson in Sri Lanka stated the government regarding the UN and its impediments to their conquest of the Tamil Tigers. By removing those organizations, they were no longer international witnesses to what was coming. 
and what was coming was a genocide. The United Nations presence, subsequent absence, and negligence in Sri Lanka are critical in understanding the ethnic cleansing of Tamil people during the Sri Lankan Civil War. Uh, referring to her life in IDP camps, Ruchi, who withstood starvation, bomb shelling, and trauma-induced insomnia, commented to me, uh, we have to hide in these bunkers in fear. If they see us, they would shoot us. A lot of people have died in this war, shot to death, not for any reasons. Some friends died too. We escaped and came here, but some of my friends stayed in the movement and were shot dead. Footage captures the Sri Lankan army forces mass murdering civilians, bombing hospitals, and raping Tamil women. In her interview, Ruchi exclaims the following regarding the rape of uh, women and men. Uh, trigger warning, rape. Uh, the Sinhalese army would abduct the girls from the movement and then di uh, ditch them naked after killing them. Likewise, they would even abandon men in a naked state near the riverbanks. It was cruel, wasn't it? It would be horrific listening to such stories. War crimes continued to take place even after the end of the war on May 16, 2009. There is an uh, unintentional tendency for the West to dictate which catastrophes in the global south gain recognition. In the case of Sri Lanka, the long neglected international discourse led to global ignorance, mass violence, and now a lackluster refrainment from justice and reparations. Uh, Nirmanusin Balasundaram addresses this plea of remembrance through his article in The Guardian. This article argues readers to remember the conflict in Sri Lanka had to continue, uh, and to continue the fight for justice. Balasundaram articulates uh, that the United Nations attempt to hold the Sri Lankan government accountable for war crimes against Tamil people. Balasundaram also discusses the Sri Lankan government's refusal to acknowledge their gross acts of violence against civilians. It seems as though Sri Lanka's government is instilling symbolic and internal councils in order to pacify the international community. Understanding that war crimes perpetuated by their own government are not a priority for the UN nor the UNHCR. Clearly, prominent global actors such as the UN, um, as well as the Sri Lankan state itself, have actively sought to hinder transparent, legitimate, and unbiased investigations. If we cannot have investigations of human rights violations, the Sri Lankan government cannot have access to, uh, to some measure of judicial review. How can we expect them to have any meaningful understanding of their own truth? Cool. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, I'd like to finish up, that was like, Whew, a lot of history, um, but I'd like to, to wrap it up by uh, speaking to a bit of my ethnography that I did. Uh, this is Jaya's story. I met Jaya on a Friday afternoon. Her swagger matched, matched that of an average Californian teenager. Her hair was bleached with hints of red, star tattoos on her neck, and more on her wrist. I later observed that her, her tattoos were drawn on with Sharpie. She had long acrylic nails and gold necklaces and rings. I eagerly introduced myself to her. Hi, Jaya. It's so good to meet you. I heard you were Sri Lankan, and I really wanted to meet you. I'm also Sri Lankan. Uh, she could sense my innocence and immediately took advantage of it. Jaya responded cheekily, Oh, uh, I don't know anything about Sri Lanka, looking down at her cell phone. For weeks, Jaya refused to engage with me in a meaningful way. She kept her personal information to herself. Her complex emotions were entangled within an ominous history. Her passive-aggressive jabs towards my elementary knowledge of Tamil were laced with defensive protection of her culture, her narrative, and her story. But what I didn't see that Friday afternoon was a hidden pain and trauma that her exterior image masked. Jaya became the epoch of my personal and complex relationship with Sri Lanka, a country that I could never call home but yearn for. Our diaspora was always challenged, from the time of Sri Lanka's independence from the British in 1948, to the burning of the Jaffna Library in 1981, to the forced migration, migration of millions of Tamils in 1983, 1990, 1995, and currently. Academia also uh, often ignores the stories of Tamil Sri Lankan refugees. The complexity of stratified identities, being Sri Lankan born, ethnically Tamil, and American refugee, take time to conceive. Uh, Jaya, uh, Jaya's use of historically black vernacular and her adoption of street attire work towards her attempt to create an identity for herself in California contributing to her social capital uh, facilitating her, and facilitating her assimilation. As time passed, she began to reveal to me parts of her hidden transcript. I was always with my dad since I was a little girl, she paused. He would take me everywhere. She casually scrolled through her phone and continued. He was pretty high up in Tamil Elam, I nodded. 
And one day, when I was five years old, we were in the jungle. My dad was shot in the leg by a government soldier. She pointed to her leg. He was shot here too. She pointed to her chest. And they hit me too. Still acting naive, I looked at in, in awe at her and responded, Oh my God, they would do that to you, a baby? Almost angrily and disappointed with my innocence, she snapped, What the fuck? Of course, they would rape a baby. When Jaya peeled back the layers of her life, I began to understand her more. However, minor embellishments all often invoked moments of speculation. Once I asked Jaya, I would love to get a chance to speak with your father. She responded defensively, oh yeah? Well, you can go and see him in prison in Thailand. Shocked, I asked her, why is he in prison? Well, he thought he was being smart, so he made a fake passport for himself to leave Sri Lanka. They didn't give him asylum because they thought he was a terrorist. So we made a fake passport and we all went to Thailand. When we got there, we stayed for many years until he was caught. Then he went to prison. Jaya seemed to hold her father on a pedestal. She admired his courage and perceived him as a war hero, willing to fight for his people by any means necessary. Still, however, I could tell that she was holding back. Jaya did not reveal to me that her father was actually in prison for other reasons. Reasons that I gathered from the people from outside the community that knew Jaya's father from Thailand. Jaya's father was actually arrested for issues regarding domestic abuse towards Jaya and her siblings. The stories that Jaya told me were symbolic and the defense mechanisms that she had constructed over time to protect herself. There are many reasons why Jaya's family experienced interfamilial violence after the war. The cycle of violence theory expounds on the notion that parents who have experienced maltreatment in their childhoods and upbringing are more likely to perpetuate violence against their children. Several findings suggest that parents' PTSD symptoms are associated with higher levels of interfamilial stress and violence. In one of our recent conversations, Jaya and I spoke about what recognizing genocide in Sri Lanka might mean for her life. You know what, Rebecca? I would feel happy if genocide was recognized in my country. Because they finally realized that our people <coughs> were dead for no reason. I inquired, what do you think you will gain personally, Jaya? She said with conviction, I will have better sleep because I will know that our people have justice. I think about my family in Sri Lanka. I lost a lot of people. Recognition will help me sleep. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I want to start by saying one of the things I love about your research is that it. it nicely situates itself in three kind of concentric areas of, re, uh, of interest, one of which is diaspora studies, diaspora identity. The second one is it's specifically about Sri Lanka. And the third one is it's a great contribution to what's called comparative genocide studies. So I'd like to give you the chance to kind of embellish a few points, respond to a few points mm -hmm. on that. Um, starting with the, the di diaspora identity, because the last point you made there about recognition allowed me to sleep. To what extent in talking with people in the Tamil diaspora, do you feel that, that that if it's not genocide, the atrocities and the violence are in a strange way the thing that keeps a diasporic identity linked to a place? Mm -hmm. In other words, it's it's really the only safe space you can talk about the violence because your first quote showed, I can't say this in Sri Lanka. So mm -hmm. to what extent is the remembrance of this really kind of almost a, a, a community glue in Sri Lanka Tamil community? Uh, that's long question. <laughs> uh, I think that recognition could do a lot of things for the diaspora, a lot of things for, for, for myself as someone who's, who wasn't born there, who was born here, um, but also for folks that were, have migrated here. Um, I think that if we continue to ignore what has happened in Sri Lanka and if recognition um, doesn't take place, uh, I'm afraid that it'll be forgotten and it will continue to happen uh, in Sri Lanka, as we've seen in the Muslim community in Sri Lanka in the past month or so. Um, but and at the same time, uh, if there's no justice for, for Tamil people and if we continue to kind of beat around the bush and, and uh, uh, pretend that what happened there wasn't a genocide, um, the community will 
will, will lose its sense of self and uh, will disappear in a way. Um, and I ask that question, and you kind of walk into it perfectly because you talk about recognition. But the problem we have is that if we go from diaspora identity to Sri Lanka, is that certainly under previous president Mahinda Rajapaksa and under the current president Rajapaksa Sena, there is not just a denial of genocide, there's a denial that this was a conflict about identity. Right. And you brought up the issue of reparations, which I find refreshingly um, ambitious. But <laughs> to what extent, uh, and that's not even as my idea, it's, I, yeah. I, I, you're like thinking way, way down the line. Right. But if, if Sri Lanka itself cannot come to terms with the fact that this was a conflict about identity as opposed to as the official position is about terrorism. Right. To what extent is even reconciliation on the map within Sri Lanka as opposed to only happening in the diaspora? There's so much work that's happening right now that um, I wasn't even aware of before I started this research. Um, there is a huge, like you mentioned, a huge diaspora presence within uh, getting this recognized in some way, shape, or form. Um, I. This is why I wanted to go to Sri Lanka and, and be on the ground and kind of see what's what's going on there. Um, but it, like I mentioned, there's this kind of state of anomie, like political anomie happening uh, in, in Jaffna and where wherever Tamil people are, uh, where because the government doesn't care about the people, um, which was displayed over the past 33 years, uh, because the government doesn't care, Anything can really happen to Tamil people and there will be no consequences, even within the diaspora itself. And one thing that we've seen in, in genocides over the course of history, uh, let alone in Sri Lanka, is that when genocide is left unrecognized, the people begin to kill themselves and their own people. And, and that's what's happening right now in, in Sri Lanka. Yeah. I think based on personal experience, I mean, it's, it's the war is only over for part of the country, right? And, and there's this there's this kind of almost indirect, not direct punishment of not rebuilding war torn areas mm -hmm. in the northern and eastern parts of the country, even as you're building, say, a new brand new billion dollar port in right. Colombo and things yeah. like that. Um, which brings me to my third question. We've only got five minutes here. I'd love to talk for hours about yeah. this. Yeah, um, <laughs> as we do. Which is, 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 as we have, and we yes. probably will do. Um, which is the larger field of of, of comparative genocide studies? Because I think you. You, you've hit upon something very important, which is your argument that this is about quality over quantity and recognizing suffering right. as opposed to counting numbers. Right. And I think you've made a very clear case for the fact that, that, that you know, genocide is not an event, it, it's, it's an event with an eternal afterlife mm -hmm. to a certain extent. And to what extent is that afterlife, for instance, um, did, did you kind of perceive that afterlife or, or, or the, the, the kind of residue of genocide mm -hmm. among the people you talked to through your research? Yeah, it was it was uh, it was <laughs> very complicated. I, I got different responses from different people depending on their situation. So with Jaya, for example, you know she's she was very direct to me about uh, the way she experienced trauma, war trauma. Um, but with other people, uh, a lot of times mo the older community in their in their thirties, they didn't even want to talk to me. And one one thing. Uh, that I got from an interview with this uh, uh, man from, uh, he was a, a part of the LTTE, and he told me, I want to be happy now. I cannot talk to you about this, because if I talk to you, I will be unhappy. And he walked out of the room. Um, so I think among, it, it really depends on who you're talking to. Yeah. Wow, that was the past five minutes. I have so many other things I have to ask you. I think I'm out of time, however. Yeah. It's all good. <laughs> Rebecca, thank you for your presentation and for your thank research. You. I hope you keep building upon this. I think you've tapped into something that's really valuable, not just for Schumann and Diaspora, but for many larger fields as well. Thanks so much. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we, we're opening up to Q&A for five minutes. kind of person, like her age group, who she is, how did you find her, and, and kind of how did you decide who you'd be engaging with? 
um, uh, with respect to uh, uh, to Jayan being remaining partially anonymous, um, I uh, took an ethnography class and I uh, I was told that I had two weeks to find a population to to interview and to spend my semester with. So. Um, Pressed with time, I uh, searched around California to find a, a, an international school that uh, worked with refugee and migrant communities in hopes of finding one person to talk to. Um, but I was blessed with three Sri Lankan Tamil refugees that went to this school, and I spent the whole semester with them. We became very, very close. I'm still close with them now. Um, they have invited me over to their homes, and we've celebrated. Uh, birthdays together, and they're just really wonderful kids. <coughs> so um, it's really connected me with the diaspora that's in uh, the community um, in a very, very special way. So that was really a blessing, yeah. <laughs> Did they know that you were talking to them for, you know, research? Yeah. Yeah, they did. That's part of the informed consent process. <laughs> so I had to, I, I let them know what I was doing from the start. And um, with Jaya, she she thought I was, she didn't think I was Sri Lankan. She thought I was uh, Latinx and had no idea why I was interested in talking about Sri Lanka uh, up until like later on when I had her read her ethnography and um, read through uh, what I've written. So yeah, they know. <laughs> Um, so I was wondering, um, did you find that the class of these refugees at all factored into their um, experience uh, regarding generational trauma? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I think that has to do with um, how the migration patterns happened out of the country. So, the first wave of immigrant of, of uh, migrants and refugees that left Sri Lanka were um, doctors and lawyers and people who had more money, um, but then a lot of folks stayed and they were like, we're gonna stay and we're gonna fight for, for Elam and fight for Tamil people. Um, but a lot of the folks that got stuck, um, it, this is very, it intersects with caste and, ra and, uh, and class a lot. I didn't get a chance to get into that, but I'm definitely, it was definitely a concern. So um, a lot of the folks that I was working with in my ethnography were, uh, were low income. Oh. Hey. Yeah. Hi. I just wanted to, your talk made me think of this, and that is in Rwanda they have set up a museum of genocide, yeah. and in South Africa there are many museums about it, and in our country they recently opened a whole museum of lynching mm -hmm. in the South. And they've been tearing down statues and things mm -hmm. of particularly racist characters. Mm -hmm. and starting these things, and this might be something that people could try to do. Oh yeah, them. absolutely. Um, uh, th yeah, there's a lot of symbolism still, of, of the war still in, in parts of Sri Lanka. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of remembering, I, we have a long list of things that we have to do in order to get recognition and to remember and all of these big questions. Um, I'm an artist, so a part of the, the things that I, uh, I do for, for Sri Lanka and for the diaspora are involved in art and preser preservation uh, through symbols. So hopefully someday, we'll see. <laughs>